Hi there, this is Rob from Auburn Amps. I want to talk today about some of the construction methods that are used inside tube guitar amplifiers, a tube musical instrument amplifiers. Now, the tube as an amplifying device has been with us for the better part of a century, and it's still the technology of choice for a, a lot of musicians because they sound splendid. And if they're willing to put up with the inconveniences, then uh, they can be rewarded with splendid sound. But uh, naturally, the construction methods that have been used by manufacturers have changed over that almost century. So what I want to do is um, talk about each of the ones that were used that are all still available to hobbyists at least, uh, to talk about the terminology and the advantages and disadvantages of each of those construction methods. Uh, the first one that was used was um, what we now call point-to-point -point wiring. Typically there would be a steel chassis with terminal strips, a little strip of phenolic with terminal lugs on it, uh, bolted to the chassis and the components would be soldered directly to these terminal lugs. And the, the circuit would be formed by the components themselves. There would be very little wiring per se. Uh, the advantage of this is that uh, there are fewer things to go wrong because there are fewer connections and it can be very solid. You could twist the chassis and the, and the components would stay in, in place. Uh, the advantage for the manufacturer, well there wasn't really a, a main advantage, it was the only game in town for the longest time, but they didn't need to have skilled technicians build radios or amplifiers. These people, the assemblers, could just be following a pictorial diagram, uh, assembling the components according to the diagram, and they'd have a working product. An advantage of point-to-point -point wiring is that the circuit could be very three-dimensional, so you can have short paths uh, where needed, and this can help minimize um, crosstalk and, and hum and that sort of thing. It's very organic. Uh, it's also a dog's breakfast to look at. It's very hard to follow uh, when you look at a point-to-point -point wired amplifier to look at, uh, to understand what the circuit is doing and what it's all about, or to reconcile it to the schematic, which is a 2D representation of a circuit. So uh, that would lead to errors in, um, in manufacturing, which is expensive for manufacturers, of course, and if you're building one yourself, it can lead to uh, errors as well. It's a great construction method, very solid. Uh, disadvantage um, is that the mass of the component is suspended by its own connections. So if it's a massy component and the thing takes some Gs, then, uh, then you could eventually wear down that, uh, that connection and, and cause some reliability issues. But if you're building one yourself, you can do it, you can do it nicely, build a very solid amplifier that way. Unfortunately, uh, if you do want to build an amp that way, you don't have a lot of legacy designs to copy because that construction method was abandoned as early as possible by manufacturers because it was prone um, to errors at the uh, assembly level. Uh, what was uh, what was moved to, what was preferable for manufacturers like Fender was the eyelet board construction. This was uh, often called point-to-point -point and is still often called point-to-point -point by um, some amp enthusiasts, but it uh, is an eyelet board similar to the, f the Fender type. But um, I'm talking about 1960s Fender amplifiers and, and early 70s. Uh, uh, they used this type of construction, except they used um, uh, a fiber a fiber board, uh, um, a paper-based board, really. This is FR4 fiberglass. But they, uh, they moved to this because uh, there were fewer errors and it was cheap for them uh, to produce these boards. You could load all the eyelets, put this in a press, boom, and uh, all the eyelets are in place. Then again, uh, unskilled workers could follow a diagram, load the components on, solder them in, and it was harder to make a mistake than with point-to-point -point wiring. The board goes into a chassis, it gets wired to, and you have a finished amplifier. A disadvantage for the manufacturer is that uh, if they were going to change the design, they pretty much had to change the board unless it was just a component level change. You were pretty much stuck with this design here. Uh, for a hobbyist, uh, you can buy these boards now and, and copy a legacy amplifier, build it the way it was built. Um, 50, 60 years ago, and that can be a very satisfying project for you. This is solid, reliable, the component body is supported by the board. There's, there's really no disadvantage of, uh, of this construction method for a hobbyist. For the manufacturer, the very first ones, uh, they didn't treat 
the phenolic in it, or it wasn't phenolic, sorry, it was fiber, and it could absorb moisture, and uh, you could have problems with oscillations or even a non-functional amplifier. They, they quickly solved that. They started to impregnate the, the board with a, a waxy substance, and those problems went away. Uh, but they don't use this anymore because it's become expensive to, uh, to produce. They've moved on to, to methods that are more, um, that lend themselves more to mass production. Similar to eyelet boards are uh, turret boards. And I don't have one here to show you, but you know, all know what, they talk, what I'm talking about. A turret board is self-explanatory. You have a strip of phenolic in the old days and uh, fiberglass now with rows of evenly spaced uh, metal turrets. Uh, swaged into the boards, very solid, and for manufacturers, they would once again have unskilled, no, I shouldn't say unskilled, they weren't unskilled people, of course they were skilled, they had to be very good at what they were doing. <laughs> My dog is here. Uh, but they could easily lay out the components without understanding what their technical function was, and uh, lay them out according to a, a diagram, and then this turret board goes into a chassis, gets wired to, and you have a functional amplifier. For a hobbyist, it's a great vehicle because you can make changes. You can easily see whether there's a mistake. You can run components on the outside of the turret. You can strip it all off and, and build an entirely new amp on a turret board. So a great hobbyist vehicle. And I'm sure boutique builders are using a turret boards as well because it's a nice... Um, uh, uh, it's sort of an intermediate between uh, point to point and and a more uh, mass produced approach. So that's the turret board. And what did manufacturers move to after eyelet boards and, and turret boards? Well, they went to printed circuit boards. And uh, the earliest printed circuit boards uh, date back to the 1950s. They were used in things like portable transistor radios. When they came to tube amplifiers, uh, problems started to creep in. The earliest circuit boards were single-sided boards, the copper was not plated, and there were adhesion issues, there were heat damage issues, there were phenolic boards which was subject to damage by heat, and so there were a lot of intermittent issues with, um, with the first printed circuit boards. And that got them a bad reputation, unfortunately, because it is possible to make a, a very solid printed circuit board that lends itself to, uh, to tube amplifier design. For the manufacturer, the advantage of a printed circuit board is obvious. They are, are cheap to manufacture and they do away uh, almost completely with mistakes, with wiring errors. You load the components into the right places, you know the circuit is good. And uh, they're very inexpensive to manufacture, especially if they take shortcuts with quality, which you don't have to do, and not ma all manufacturers have to do either. Uh, there's a printed circuit board uh, for a tube amplifier with ventilation holes for heat producing components. That's key. That's something that was often missed even after multiple generations uh, if mass produced amplifiers. Uh, no finger pointing here, but if you're a tech, you've been inside them, you've seen that people big name manufacturers have soldered large resistors, heat producing resistors right onto the board. The heat eventually um, weakens the, the components connection, the solder connection. This happens with tube sockets as well. Or the tubes are oriented so that the heat gathers under the board and damages other connections, uh, shortens the lives of uh, electrolytic capacitors which don't like heat, especially the, um, the inexpensive ones that tend to creep in mass-produced amplifiers. None of these things need to be problems. Uh, a, a printed circuit board with um, thicker copper, uh, double-sided with plated through holes with proper ventilation for heat producing components can be as reliable as any other uh, manufacturing method, whether it's soldered by hand or even machine soldered ones. Uh, uh, a good wave soldering or dip soldering, which is available to on a smaller scale as well, or at least dip soldering is, wave soldering is a huge machine. They can be done well. So don't um, walk away from amps just because they have circuit boards in them. It can be done well. And, and you can even make uh, printed circuit boards yourself. Now, I'm not talking about etching the, the copper like some hobbyists have done in the past, but what you can do is design a circuit board, upload it to a manufacturer, have three or five boards sent to you, and load them up at home. It's reasonably inexpensive. And... Um, and very satisfying to make something that, that seems like a manufactured product.
product and can be super reliable as well. Anyway, that's a rundown of construction methods for tube guitar amplifiers. I hope I've uh, cleared some things up, especially this question of what is point-to-point -point wiring and what isn't. True point-to-point -point wi wiring uses the components as bridges between terminal strips, minimizes connections, is sort of this 3D organic representation of the, of the circuit that allows for very short circuit paths. Islet board, which is what um, Fender used in the uh, 60s and, and 70s, is not point-to-point -point wiring because a signal path is not direct. It has intervening wires and islets and, and so on. Anyway, uh, this is Rob from Auburn Amps wishing you a day full of music. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.